Hello to viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about indirect evaporative cooling. So let's dive deep into it. So what exactly is the problem here? Well, problem is desert cooler are basically one of the oldest, or it's not even fair to say old, it's ancient technology of achieving what we call a sub ambient cooling. Meaning if you're a fan, if you're running a fan, all fan will do is move air around. It can't cool it. Uh, it just helps us to, uh, you know, evaporate our sweat away. That makes us feel cool, but nothing more than that. But coolers or uh, desert cooler, swamp cooler or evaporative coolers, they were the first devices that allowed us to go below Ambient, meaning in daytime Egypt and it's like a reaching ludicrously high temperatures not from today's standard from that standard uh, 35 degrees Celsius you can drop it below 35 degrees Celsius so same uh, that was the whole point uh, sub ambient meaning outside could be 35 you could literally be living in as low as uh, let's say 28 so sub ambient system now it is amazingly well for very dry, place, uh, dry places and very hot places so if it's hot and if it's dry it will work amazingly well and that's the reason why this sort of structures are found everywhere where it's like very deserty so it does work however uh, it drinks water continuously it's not like oh it maintains a temperature and all. there is no pwm into this it's just like drinks water and yes uh, some of the designs in certain scenarios could actually get really really cold so so th there had to be some <coughs> old school management system where it's like, okay, let's uh, uh, over the vent, put the wood or over the vent. So, you know, circulation does not happen too much. Although it's a rare, but could happen. And uh, water is used as a refrigerant in this sort of system. And yes, water does have a re refrigeration designation that is R718. Uh, and uh, it does draw very little motor power, meaning in the uh, early years of humanities, uh, evolution to make a air conditioned scenario this was one of the favorite option because it consumed a lot of water but not a lot of power meaning electricity was expensive back in the day but water was free so people were really um, you know focused on this although it did came with one penalty that it dumped all the moisture into your living space meaning it was really bad for things for example for people for some reason living in wooden houses yeah it will destroy your wooden houses so it has to be used very uh, sparingly so to say and again uh, in india back in the early days when we used to have vhs uh, they were like yeah vhs humidity not good uh, basically vietnam vhs air cooler not good again we have to develop vcd for that uh, so moisture is not a good thing in your living spaces and you pay attention to every medication it will always say cool and dry places look into anything it will always say cool and dry it will never say cool and wet <laughs> so there is a genuine problem with it it does work it does allow us to achieve sub ambient uh, and it's non-toxic and all that jazz but uh, and power consumption is minuscule but it does dump wet damp air into your indoor living space which is not desirable so we come to indirect evaporative cooling. So the idea is what if we disassociate two parts, basically put a uh, big ass heat exchanger in this. So heat exchanger is the key here. And the idea is moisture cannot go from one to another, but heat can. That's the whole point of heat exchanger. So you will have something like this uh, and you will have dry channels and wet channel. So air will come from basically your fan. It could be two separate fan also and air will go. It will go through the heat exchanger. It will cool down and it will go into your indoor. So let's say outdoor uh, ambient. Uh, relative humidity was 30%, it will remain 30%. It will not add even a single ounce to it. Uh, so percentage remains the same, but you get cooler. So it could be 40 degrees Celsius, it could come down to 30 degrees Celsius. Okay, then how the heck you achieve the cooling? Well, the heat exchanger gets uh, basically sprayed with water and air goes through it. Penalty, uh, that air becomes very humid. So relative humidity, if some systems are automated, they will try to reach as close to 100% relative humidity as possible. Again, it can't reach absolute 100%, but it's like 90, 95%. Yeah, that air is very destructive if that reaches indoor living spaces. So that will be directly exhausted out. We call it secondary air in some scenarios. We call it exhaust in other scenarios. So that is doing the primary cooling and the heat exchange is allowing you to leach that cooling. Basically, it's like, hey, take my heat away. Uh, evaporate the water, water yeets out of there and you go inside without changing your own humidity without uh, basically uh, and having the same temperature, you actually drop in the temperature. So you can go from 37 to 20 degrees Celsius. It does not go very below uh, the temperature, uh, but you can get cooling and it does work. It's just a heat exchanger. Uh, how do we make that heat exchanger? It's nothing fancy. Some designs use aluminum, some designs use uh, stainless steel, some newer construction are looking for polymers and you're like, aren't polymers insulators? Yes. Uh, 
uh, but you can make them thin enough and they are uh, basically very good at stopping water so they, they actually work surprisingly so and there are some designs that are working with ceramics there's nothing fancy basically if you if you have a sheet metal place you can just stamp these things out nothing fancy the idea is you just have a two uh, cross channel so one air uh, goes in water comes from the top and you flow air counter flow it this whole heat exchanger cools down and the input air completely cools down so this is what we call indirect evaporative cooling now this does give you sub ambient cooling it does give you uh, basically what we call humidity free cooling so this is the first stage then we go to M cycle. Now M cycle is uh, somebody figured out, hey, what if we have feedback loop? Now let this be very clear, it's not popular in every design and uh, it is uh, like messy, so to say. But if done correctly, this can go below the wet bulb temperature. Meaning uh, if you take a thermometer, put a wet cloth on top of it, like mercury thermometers, you put it and you just blow air through it, how cool it can go, there is upper limit to it. This puppy can go below that. Meaning if you're like a wet bulb temperature is 22 degrees Celsius, this is like I can drop it to 18. So that's the whole point. So they figured out how to do a positive feedback loop. Now all designs do not use this as a second system. They may have forced it into one stage. Some designs have two separate stage, but uh, the feedback makes it really, really powerful because uh, it allows you to leach a cool air send it back into wet channel like why would you want to do that well let's say you have dry channel it has already pre-cooled you pre-cooled it cool awesome gg but here still that cool air can now absorb far more moisture it's like the, its moisture handling capacity went up so you literally send it back now it's like okay let me eat up more moisture what is the penalty of that it eats up more moisture temperature of these materials goes down meaning the incoming air becomes cooler that goes again and you realize and so instead of the outside air outside temperature will have a wet bubble temperature this drops it it's like now you can go below so you can have three to five degrees celsius drop on top of it so this really works meaning uh, in some designs they have to actually maintain the system it's uh, because again if you have stage one stage two you can go very very cold like cold is such a cold scenario where if it's not maintained actively people will start to feel uncomfortable under uh, because it's like whoa it's cool it's like chilly cool kind of scenario uh, so it does work and again then you have to have a computer that has a lookup table like this it's like entropy diagram so to say and it's like okay where's the temperature where's the feedback what is the relative moisture what is the relative wet bulb temperature all of that has to be controlled it does work but it does give you cool and dry air that's the whole point meaning if you have a place where you have a lot of water but uh, you want to cool down a data center you cannot risk moisture going in so you must have to have very cool because again power density is too goddamn high you need very low temperature 20 degrees celsius will not do 15 degrees celsius will do this is like I will give you 15 degrees Celsius. So people would I just you take the water and send it through the wet channel again. Now it does require you to engineer in such a way that only air goes in, moisture does not come out. It is messy, but it is doable. We have been doing it for quite some time. It does work, but it does require control system. Otherwise, it will it's surprisingly quickly how quickly this thing can reach uncomfortable temperature. It's like, yeah, cool. Okay, okay, okay. Whoa, 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 bro. Whoa. So I think that's why most of the companies that are utilizing that they are not doing it multi-stage. It's like, bro, it gets too cold. So they are just using one stage, cool. And it does give you good stable temperature, but it is complex. Meaning if you really want to flex this, this is how you're going to achieve very cool temperature and cold. Now, of course, it will not reach minus 18 degrees Celsius, but it will go cool. So this is M cycle systems that we utilize to <clears throat> pump the power. But again, you will rarely find that because either it's a patent locked system or it's like just too overkill, so to say. Then we come to abiotic cooling. Uh, basically, it's just a desert cooler, so to say. Uh, adiabatic cooling. So whenever you're watching tutorials, videos and product uh, demonstration, they'll use some fancy word to confuse you. That's what that is. Basically, they have indirect um, heat exchanger. On top of that, they have normal, uh, you know, desert cooler and like why the heck would you do that well here's it in war, uh, if you have an indoor environment that is moisture tolerant for example a food market a kitchen things that can handle moisture uh, you can directly utilize that now like why well if you have a cooler air it can absorb a bit more water and drop temperature even further meaning let's say 30 degrees celsius came in you got 25 degrees celsius here and if you did this you can drop it to 22 degrees celsius and from our point of view, from our psychological point of view, from our nervous system point of view, if a 22 degrees Celsius uh, air does not feel wet even if it has higher humidity, feel wise. And again, uh, inherently at that sort of low temperature, the mold risk and all that is not that bad uh, of a scenario. And another scenario is that you, uh, you must have seen people hate air conditioning because it makes your skin dry out because it's too goddamn dry. 
sometimes it's like hey and other systems use this as a humidity maintenance system if you have really really dry air outdoors this will be like you know let's just maintain it at a good level for human beings so in those sort of scenario they have a normal uh, indirect uh, heat exchanger that does the primary bulk loading and then you add a little bit of extra cooling so to get a uh, extra boost because be mindful there is another benefit once you have the water spray 100% of water will not evaporate away majority of the water will actually come back to the reservoir but even if you started with hot indian water which is 50 degrees celsius yes that's how hot our water tank gets uh, that water will cool down to 20 degrees celsius now you can circulate that and again that's why m cycle is so dangerous <laughs> you can literally have 50 degrees celsius hot water cooling and then um, you collect that cool water then it's sent into that wet channel as a second phase <sighs> cools so uh, that second water will be allow you to achieve much more oomph. Here, it just allows you to maintain the humidity. So if they are keeping wine and all that, they are like, hey, we need to maintain absolutely perfect uh, humidity level. This becomes an like auto control unit where it's like, this is the bulk loader and this is like humidity control mechanism. So it works very cheap, very low cost, and it's massively adapted. Meaning majority of the time when you're looking for uh, systems to install in your building or structures, they will generally give you this package. So you'll have an indirect heat system and then you will have di uh, direct pad basically. A moisture control so to say so it's up to you suitable for supermarkets kitchens things of this nature but be mindful if you are like nah i want super, uh, server schooling no don't even think about it no that's just like no just know it so adiabatic cooling they use fancy word is just a desert cooler swamp cooler on top of indirect cooling it does give you a better uh, cooler temperature but humidity does add up so overall this technology is what we classify as okay it's uh, not good, not uh, bad, but it's just like, okay, uh, because here's the deal. It's not that useful in modern times. We kind of knew how to use this. And again, ancient technology is just that um, uh, instead of being power hungry, it's thirsty. It's like, yeah, I will not consume kilowatts of power. I will drink uh, kiloliters of water. I'm like, yeesh, water is harder to find uh, because here's the deal. Let's just assume I make a lot of money. What I will I do? I'll put a giant solar farm in uh, my rooftop and then I'll have giant battery bank and done. Power problem is sorted. That's today's technology. But here's the deal. What if I, instead of that, I just uh, use a normal, uh, this sort of indirect system with M cycle, so I get really cool temperature. Yeah, where the heck I'll get, keep getting the water? Water is limited. <laughs> so fundamentally, that's why people are not that excited about that. And people just saying it saves 80% of power. It's like, dude, look at the water. Because again, let that be very clear. Water is location based. Some places it rains so much like you do not have to worry about water or you could be so water rich places. Like there are certain places in India where you have surrounded by mountain. This whole area is like saturated with water. The groundwater is like punch in the ground, water comes out. So there they, they cannot do anything with water. Like water is that abundant for them. For them, it's like GG. Although they don't need that much heat because uh, cooling because it's not that hot. So large scale cooling actually uses the same technology. Like you must have paid attention to the fact if you buy air conditioner, let's say in India, again, similar sort of structure would be used in all other uh, countries. So in our cases, it's called ICER, uh, basically Indian Seasonal Energy Efficiency Rating. So this puppy at best case scenario, you have a split air conditioner, best of the best. It's only going to go to five COP wise. And again, that's optimum COP at optimum temperature, blah, blah, blah. It does never reaches that. But that's optimal. Here's the deal. You go into a large building and you look at their chiller, they will have ludicrously high COP. They will be like, you know, nine. I'm like, how the heck that's achievable? Well, it's not achievable. Uh, you do not have a magic refrigerant. Heck, even ammonia does not have that kind of COP. So how the heck they are achieving it? Well, they're cheating. So basically their hot side, it's a swamp cooler. The hot side literally dumps all the hot water into this uh, system. This system boils it away or evaporates it away to be more technical. That's what is happening here. So, oh, and be mindful, uh, if you look into it, research them, you may find something like closed loop and open loop, and that might freak you out. It's like, okay, it's uh, not open loop then. Well, closed loop simply means the coolant does not exchange, meaning you're gonna have your uh, material. This is a, like an open system. So your hot water comes in, it sprays out into the film material. You have a fan pulling air through it. It goes down and then collection bin. Now this is very cheap, does work, does have a penalty that it will A, uh, reduce your water, uh, basically your water consumption would be higher. B, your water will be contaminated by dirt, uh, chemicals and acid rain and all that jazz. So it's not good, meaning your um, chiller circuitry does have to handle with corrosion and all that. But again, if you manage to seal this part up and make sure that you have absolutely pure distilled water or as pure as you can make it, like a coal power plant, in those sort of scenario, you, that loop is completely intact. It will remain intact for years. But then how would you cool it? That you will have a giant heat sink. Uh, that heat sink, you will spray water on top. 
that water will evaporate away. So let that be very clear. Do not ever get confused by, oh, it's a closed loop now. No, closed loop simply means the coolant is closed loop. So sometimes they might want to use glycol. It's generally preferred in uh, colder places. I do not know what cold places are, but apparently people in Canada have to use that. Otherwise it will freeze and crack the pipes. So they could use that. And when it's really, really hot, you spray water on top and it evaporates away, exactly like this. So it does work. That's why we are getting uh, like, you know, you can cool these giant buildings. Otherwise, there is no technology where you can dump that much heat into air directly. Like air does not have that kind of capacity. That's why we are relying on latent heat of vaporization of water. The only possibility is that if we use a CO2 that has hot or ammonia that can handle very high rejection temperature. That way you can have high enough heat, enough airflow can uh, dump heat away from it. Then you can directly run a dry system without consuming water like there is no tomorrow. So it's not that uh, big deal. And be mindful, the, why the heck we go through all this much trouble? Well, simply because it does allow much higher temperature delta. For example, uh, the T delta you can achieve, even with M cycle, it's not that great. And the moment you pack a lot of people, basically you have a giant building, the system will poop itself. It's like it's designed for low stress scenario. It's like, you know, there are people, but not too many people. So in those sort of scenario, it makes sense. But if you like, you know, hundreds of people like a cinema theater or things of this nature, where you have like gyms and all that, yeah, no. The system will be like, bro, no, no. You have to put too much of it or drink too much water. So in this sort of scenario, utilizing this consumes less water. Like, wait a minute, why it consumes less water? It heats up the water, na? In other scenarios, all you are doing is relying on only latent heat of vaporization. Here, you are heating it up. So even if the water coming in into your closed loop could be 20 degrees Celsius, you can take that 20 degrees Celsius water to 30, 35 or some scenarios, 47 or 55 degrees Celsius and then run the circuit. So that jump from 20 degrees to 55 degrees, that delta is extra. So you get more oomph out of it. So that's why. Now at this point in time, uh, focusing on better refrigerant would be wiser, meaning uh, more and more refrigerators are already switching to uh, butane. Uh, okay, a lot of small um, ice makers are butane already and a uh, lot of refrigerators are also switching to that. And for uh, air conditioning, uh, propane is the best. Uh, for uh, large air conditioning system, ammonia is the best. And if you want to have uh, hot rejection and do not want to deal with ammonia, or fire hazard of it, uh, CO2 is the best, but it does have a very poor COP, but it works. And those things are far more desirable rather than boiling water away, because again, we have been doing it anyway. So it's an okay idea of like having, I really like the idea of M cool, and but unfortunately it's either it's patent locked or very few companies make it, or that water um, basically folding air through without uh, letting moisture come out, it's like maybe a bit more difficult than anticipated. So it's a okay technology to look into it. So this was my presentation on basically indirect evaporative cooling. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst a friend. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.